wages, perhaps the most important numbers in our lives. So how are they determined? This lecture is based on chapter nine of my book, Economics for the Rest of Us. After the subprime crisis, Congress passed a law that requires companies to report the ratio between the pay of the CEO and the wage of the median worker. In 10% of companies, this ratio is about 300. In 50% of companies, the ratio is 69 or above. The median employee wage in these companies was $64,000 a year or about $30 an hour. That means that in the most unequal companies, the CEO makes $9,000 an hour. And in the median ratio company, the CEO makes $2,000 an hour. Why do CEOs make so much more than workers? Because they deserve to, economists explain. There are two theories of wages. The first one claims that one is paid what one deserves. Each worker earns the value of the goods he or she produces. This is a comforting theory because it relies on wealthiness. The th second theory does not rely on wealthiness at all. It says that one's rate of pay is determined by one's relative power to say no. For the worker, it's the power to say no to a low wage. And for an employer, it is the power to say no to a high wage. The theory that mainstream economists subscribe to is the first one. It is a successful theory in that many workers believe that their meager wages are all that they deserve and that CEOs deserve every penny that they earn as well. And this is the theory that we will start exploring in this lecture. The second theory will be discussed a bit later in the course. The theory that econ economists believe in, the first one, concludes with a warning. Government intervention to increase wages will result in unemployment. Each worker is paid the value of what she produces, and no employer can pay a worker more than the value she brings in. During the coronavirus pandemic, many people did not believe the claim that workers were paid what they deserved. There was a widely shared belief that essential workers did not get what they deserved. This grocery store worker earned $15 an hour if he lived in New York City and $7.25 an hour if he lived in one of the states that have not raised the minimum wage above the federal minimum. These workers worked under very dangerous conditions. Many of them died, and if they themselves did not, some of them have passed the virus to family members who did. $15 an hour or $7.25 an hour is not sufficient compensation for these hazards, and there was a clamor for hazard pay but the belief in the theory that workers are paid all they deserve is strong. At the time that this is being recorded, Congress has refused to intervene. We don't know yet how economists will justify this lack of intervention, how they will tell us that essential workers did in fact get all they deserved. But the hazard will dissipate and with it the belief that it is possible for workers not to get what they deserve. Do workers get the value of what they produce in normal times? Let's apply the theory to actual cases. Let's start with a call for car service. When a passenger is transported to her destination, Uber gets one third of the fare. If the driver earns the value of what she has produced, it must be that she and the car have transported the passenger only two thirds of the way and that Uber, the Uber app completed the trip. 
but this is of course silly. The driver, the car, and the Uber app are all a team, and each of them was essential to producing the trip. Remove the driver, and there is no trip. So why does the driver earn about $9 an hour when the CEO gets $45 million a year? Here is another set of wages that we will try to explain with the theory that workers get the value of the product that they produce. An ambulance call. It could be for a car accident, a sports, sports injury, or any one of many other emergencies. But this one happens to be for a person who is not feeling well at home. The ambulance arrives, the EMT determines she does not have to administer CPR or oxygen. She, she suspects a heart attack, decides on the hospital that is best suited for that patient, administers EKG and transmits it to the hospital. This saved precious time in the emergency room. The patient survives and all is well. This example illustrates the findings of the Duke University School of Medicine about the one factor that is most crucial to survival after a heart attack. This factor is the EMS. Over the course of a year, the team that includes the driver, the EMT, the hospital staff, including its CEO, the nurses and the doctors, saves 100 lives. What is the value the market places on this work? The median driver earns $12.45 an hour, or about $26,000 annually. Of course, this driver does not live in New York City because the minimum wage in the city is $15 an hour. But this is national data, and we see that 10% of drivers make less than $10 an hour. The median EMT earns $17 an hour with an annual income of about $35,000. What about the CEO of the hospital? These are the salaries of the presidents of not-for-profit hospitals. The six highest paid presidents together make about $85 million or $14 million a year each. Without either a driver or an EMT, no lives would be saved. The hospital staff, including janitors, doctors, nurses, and the CEO, are all members of the team too. But this means that each of them is indispensable and that the productivity of each of them cannot be separated from the productivity of the rest. Neither workers nor CEO are paid the value of the product they produce because what they produce cannot be measured. Here is a second fact that any theory of wages must explain. Between 1950 and 1979, wages and productivity grew together. Since 1979, productivity continued to grow at its traditional pace, but wages remained relatively flat. And the question is why? Economists believe that workers get the value of the product they produce, and they therefore argue that the increase in productivity is due to robots. Robots replaced workers, and the productivity of the remaining workers stayed the same, they argue. But even if manufacturing requires fewer workers, workers are still essential to production, and production is still by teams. Let's look at the number of workers required to build 1,000 cars over time. It may appear that the number of workers per 1,000 vehicles produced moves all over the place. Here it is at 9, here it is at 12, 
then it drops to seven, but then it rises again to nine. But this is because technology is not the only factor that determines how many workers are hired by a car factory. When we add vehicle production to the diagram, we see that the spike in workers per car that begins in 2007 and peaks in 2009 is due to the collapse in car production caused by the subprime crisis. Workers were not laid off immediately, and this caused the spike. But in the preceding years, car production was relatively stable, and the years following 2009 saw a booming car industry. We pick one year from each of the stable periods. One year is 2004, and the other one is 2016. And we see a drop of workers per vehicle from 9.3 to 7.8, and 19% decrease. But in some vague sense, the remaining workers are more productive than the workers that the robots replaced, since robots do the most routine jobs. Mercedes offers its cars with many options, and apparently a buyer of a Mercedes car must choose between four different lugs for attaching the wheels to the car. Workers are more flexible than robots, and by the logic of the theory, the use of robots increases the productivity of auto workers. But this, of course, is totally abstract. With robots, production is still by teams. Remove the robots, and there is no product. Remove the workers, and there is no product. But this means that individual productivities cannot be measured. This brings us back to the grocery store worker. He is just as essential without a pandemic. Without him, we would not be able to eat. Does he get paid the value of what he produces or of what he deserves? Of course, the farm workers who grow the food are members of his team, and so are the truck drivers who deliver the food from the farm to the store. The CEOs of the grocery store and of the trucking company and the manager of the farms are also members of his team. Their total product can be measured easily. It is just the sum of all the wages, CEO compensations, and the profits of the businesses involved. This sum is called value added. But because they are all members of a team, these wages, CEO compensations, and company profits are unrelated to productivities. How are wages determined then? This is food for thought and the subject of the following lectures.